What if there was literally no upper limit to the amount of protein we could consume after a workout? For decades, I mean literally decades, science has told us, the muscle magazines have told us, even the protein powder companies have told us, the most protein you can absorb after a workout is 25, 30, 30, maybe 40 grams if you're lucky. Well, new data from cell reports, a really solid randomized control trial human data tells us otherwise. There is a little bit of a catch and we do have to understand some of the caveats with this study. So in this video, we're gonna break it down. We're gonna break down what happened in this study, but what it means for you and how much protein you really can have post-workout because I'll tell you right now, you can have a lot more than we've been told. In essence, we used to think that there was a cap and it made sense. We used to think if you have 35, 40 grams of protein, that is it. Anything else above and beyond that would just get oxidized. It wouldn't necessarily turn into fat or do anything bad. It would just be a waste. It would become quote unquote oxidized. The amino acids would be oxidized. So what would matter is, well, how much protein do you consume and how much of it goes into muscle protein synthesis? So we thought, okay, well, when you look at some of these premature studies, 35, 40 grams of protein, that was it. But when you think about nature, that doesn't really make sense. Does it make any sense that in nature, we would be capped at like 25 or 30 grams? That makes no sense. Most things in nature are going long periods of time without eating, and then they get some kind of kill or whatever, and they eat a large bolus. Now, I know we're not snakes, but there's a lot of data even showing that snakes have elevated protein synthesis for 10 days after a meal. Now, obviously those are reptiles, completely different world, but it begs the question, what about other mammals, right? Like animals that are out in the wild, they might go three, four days. Then you're expecting them to divvy up what they got into 25, 30 gram servings for the next few days? No way. They're eating like 200, 300 grams plus protein. And I assure you, a lot of it is not going to waste. So this study was interesting because it looked at just this in humans. Now, it was a randomized control trial, and what they did is they had subjects work out for 60 minutes, okay? And then after the workout, they took blood tests, they took muscle biopsies, and then they had them consume either zero grams of protein in a shake, 25 grams of protein in a shake, or check this out, 100 grams of protein in a shake. And they did this with tracers. So they were able to label the protein. What this means is they were able to watch where the protein, where the amino acids went in the human body using tracers. So now they could ingest it, they could see, well, where's the protein going? Is it getting oxidized or is it going into the muscle? So after they gave them those protein shakes, they took more blood tests and they took more muscle biopsies. Over a 12 hour period, they took three muscle biopsies seriously in-depth stuff, and they took blood tests every 30 or 60 minutes, ranging from zero to 720 minutes. So we got a lot of data here. What they found was nothing short of amazing. That really just almost liberates us. It makes it so that we're not going to have to be confined to these blocks of protein intake, where we can relax a little bit and just have a big bunch of protein and then not worry about eating for a few hours or a day. What they found is that more protein ingestion led to a rapid increase in amino acid levels in the plasma. That's no real surprise, but it did happen in a dose-dependent fashion. Okay, so what that means is whatever amount of protein they took in, there was an appropriate increase in plasma amino acids. If they consumed 25 grams of protein, amino acids elevated this much in the blood. If they consumed 100 grams of protein, amino acids elevated this much in the blood. It was dose-dependent. Now, amino acids elevating doesn't tell us everything because we need to know where those amino acids actually went. But the bottom line with this was the more protein that was consumed, the more that was actually absorbed. But now let's investigate where it actually went. And this is where the tracers come in because we could actually watch where the protein went. The first thing they noticed with the tracers is that even after 12 hours, amino acids continued to quote unquote disappear from the circulation. So researchers could see that these amino acids were going up in the bloodstream and then they'd disappear. Not necessarily oxidize, but we knew they were going somewhere. Imagine having like an air tag on a car and watching where it's going and you're watching it on a tracker and then all of a sudden it just disappears off the freeway. You're wondering, 
Hmm, well, we know it went somewhere. Well, we were able to investigate this more, and that's where the muscle biopsies come in. What they found is that the 100 gram protein serving ended up increasing muscle protein synthesis more than the 25 gram serving. There was an increase, there was more muscle protein synthesis, and it wasn't just a little bit, it was a lot. So 100 grams of protein increased muscle protein synthesis way more than 25 grams did. What the heck? The old news tells us that 100 grams of protein would just get wasted. Let's see what the researchers had to say, and I quote, there's a strong positive correlation between protein intake and a whole body protein balance. And what they found is that the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, the ones that are most important for actual muscle protein synthesis, they were elevated significantly in the muscle tissue. Okay, what does that mean in human terms? What does that mean for you? It means that when you consume 100 grams of protein, the amino acids that are most important for you building muscle are going where they need to go. So even though other amino acids may get oxidized, and that's what we've seen in old literature, the most important ones, particularly leucine, are going exactly where they need to go. Because we know so much more today than we did 10 years ago when these older studies were out. Now we know that if leucine is getting into the muscle, we're triggering muscle protein synthesis. This is phenomenal, phenomenal news. But it gets even better because if you first look at this study, it talks about digestibility a lot. So in essence, the more protein that you consume, the longer it takes to digest. It's not magic. It's not like you can consume 100 grams of protein and then three hours later consume 50 grams and it's gonna do anything different than consuming 150 throughout the course of the day. Essentially what this is telling us is that if you do eat it in one sitting, you're still safe. You're going to absorb it. It's just going to balance out because it's going to take longer to absorb it. So what this study found is that 12 hours later, after consuming 100 grams of protein, there was still muscle protein synthesis occurring. It's just because you ate more, it took longer to digest. But what this tells us is you don't need to be eating every two or three hours. If you eat a lot of protein post-workout, you're good for a lot of the day. But the study also demonstrated that even in the first four hours, when subjects had more protein, they had 20% more protein synthesis in the first four hours. So just having more protein in the first place sent a stronger signal in the first four hours. And then the following four to eight hours, the following four hours, there was a 40% increase. So no matter what, eating more protein signals more of an anabolic response in the short term and in the long term. Now, if you look at the kinds of protein that they consumed, they consumed like a milk protein isolate in this particular case. Milk protein is like 80% casein protein, which digests slow. So perhaps they were having a longer digestion simply because of the type of protein. If you were to add a whey protein into that mix, you'd put yourself in a spot where you'd have a big spike in the beginning and then have a long duration burn afterwards. So we do need to talk about what happens in this study and how that translates into what you do specifically, but I'll lay it out right here as far as the protein is concerned. I would recommend whey protein post-workout because it absorbs fast and the muscle protein synthesis and the signaling is going to be really high. And then you'd wanna combine a slower digesting protein right after that. So it's like whey protein shake, and then maybe lean beef right after that, or lean chicken breast, a meat source. That way, that's gonna to continue to burn. So you get the big spike, and you get the afterburn with the protein. It's a huge benefit. The protein that I would recommend, I put a link down below, it's called Bomar Nutrition. Hands down, the best tasting whey protein I have ever had in my life. I cannot go back to another whey protein shake after having this stuff because it tastes like a dang McDonald's milkshake. And it's sweetened with allulose and monk fruit. It's not sweetened with sucralose. So they've got like a strawberry milkshake flavor. They've got cookies and cream. They've got all these flavors. And for the record, Josh, the owner of Bomar Nutrition, he and I are close friends and they used to use sucralose. And upon talking to me, they've changed all their formulations to get rid of the sucralose. Some of them still have them, they're phasing them out, but they're bringing products in sweetened with stevia, monk fruit, and allulose, which is a huge testament to their forward thinking. So the protein shakes that I'm recommending are the ones that are sweetened with allulose and stevia, monk fruit, all that linked down below. You have to try them, I kid you not, 
They are the best tasting protein shakes you will ever have. I can pretty much assure you that they're unreal. So that link is down below and that is a special discount link as well. So not only do you get good tasting whey protein shakes, you're getting ones at a special discount specifically for my viewers. They've been a sponsor on this channel for a long time. So a big thank you to them. And if you support them, you're supporting this channel. So that link is down below in the top line of the description. The other thing that this study found is that there was an increase in connective tissue protein synthesis as well. So if you're looking to like make sure your joints are healthy, more protein right after a workout is really, really solid. I wanna read you an excerpt that's very important from this study because now we start to wonder, is there actually an upper limit? They tested 100 grams, but when they look at the data, they find that there's no real drop off at 100 grams. What I mean by that is there wasn't a plateau or a drop off when protein increased as far as what was going into the amino acid pool, what was going into the bloodstream. If they had tested 200 grams, would it have just kept going up? Now, there is always going to be an upper limit. Like if you go too far, like who knows what you'll do. But the bottom line is, it seems as though the more protein that you take in, it just increases the amino acid levels, which is wild. Here's what the researchers had to say. Collectively, these data show that the ingestion of a large amount of protein requires a prolonged time period to allow complete digestion, amino acid absorption, exogenous protein-derived amino acid release into the circulation, and subsequent amino acid incorporation into tissue. What this essentially means is the more protein you consume, the longer it will take to digest but we don't seem to see any upper limit. So if 100 grams theoretically takes 10 hours, then maybe 200 grams theoretically takes 15 hours. But what this tells us is in a lot of different categories, we don't need to fall victim to eating all the time. You could finish your workout, potentially eat 150 grams of protein, get your entire protein serving for the day in one sitting, and then just relax the rest of the day and not have to worry about getting your protein in. You know how much this liberates us? How many years I spent bringing Tupperware with me, making sure that I got enough protein? And I'm not saying you need to fast or do anything, but it's suggesting that get most of your protein after your workout when the signal's strong, and then just kind of chill the rest of the day and don't have to worry about it quite so much. So for me, it's 50 grams of whey protein, and it's probably another 30 or 40 grams of like some form of meat. I'm getting a lot. I'm getting close to 100 grams of protein right after my workout, then all I need to do is trickle in another 100 or so throughout the rest of the day for me personally. The biggest thing that we need to remember here is that leucine was a key factor. This also begs one very important question, and I'm hoping that you're still on this video now because this is one of the most important things that we can note. I have often speculated that essential amino acids, like taking essential amino acids or even branch chain amino acids to a certain degree, and getting leucine in could be very, very powerful. If leucine seems to be the most powerful thing that they've seen here with these tracer studies, then maybe adding essential amino acids or branch chain amino acids, if you wanna go that route, there's some flaws there, with your post-workout, maybe you're increasing leucine availability even more. Because there's older data that suggests that leucine can increase muscle protein synthesis of protein that it is co-ingested with. In other words, if I had a protein shake and added leucine to it, it would increase the muscle protein synthesis of that protein shake. So maybe what we need to do is consume protein. And if we don't have the ability to eat a lot of protein, just from a stomach distensibility side of things, like we're full, pound a little bit of essential amino acids or something and get the leucine even higher. We can speculate that you get even more of those aminos, particularly the leucine, into the actual tissue. The goal is to get as much of that muscle protein synthesis as we can not just whole body synthesis, but isolated in the muscle. And that is where leucine matters the most. I will see you tomorrow.